Coming soon to a theater near you, it's Bob Iger 2, Return of the CEO. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Chris Hill, joining me in studio, Motley Fool Senior Analyst Jason Moser. Thanks for being here. Hey, hey. Late Sunday night, the Disney Board of Directors fired CEO Bob Chapek. Former CEO Bob Iger is back in the corner office for the next two years. Um, in the statement from the board, Susan Arnold, who's the chairman, said, quote, We thank Bob Chapek for his service to Disney over his long career, including navigating the company through the unprecedented challenges of the pandemic. The board has concluded that as Disney embarks on an increasingly complex period of industry transformation, Bob Iger is uniquely situated to lead the company through this pivotal period. Shares of Disney up 7% this morning. We'll get to the company, we'll get to the business, and we'll get to Bob Iger. Can we start with the board? Sure. Can we start with the board of directors that, four months ago, five months ago, renewed Chapek's contract for two more years, and the statement behind that news was, we are one, we are lockstep behind Bob Chapek. This is our guy. Yeah. Yeah, take a trip back in time with me, Chris, because I I really do. I I think you you know you you at the very top. I think read a read the the quote the the statement from the board. I understand what they're saying, but I mean if you go back to just June when they re-upped him, like you said, let's let's read what they said then too. And I quote: Disney was dealt a tough hand by the pandemic, yet with Bob Chapek at the helm, our business from parks to streaming not only weathered the storm but emerged in a position of strength. In this important time of growth and transformation, the board is committed to keeping Disney on the successful path it is on today. And Bob's leadership is key to achieving that goal. Bob is the right leader at the right time for the Walt Disney Company, and the board has full confidence in him and his leadership team." End quote. Wow, that escalated quickly. I don't know what changed, and all I can tell you, there is something here that we're not getting. <laughs> something changed, and it's not just. I refuse to believe that it's just this most recent quarterly results. That could have been the straw that broke the camel's back, but something else is going on here because this doesn't fully add up. Yeah, we were saying right before we started recording, there's going to be a story that comes out later this week or later this year or at some point in the future that really gives. More insight into this process. Reportedly, uh, the board contacted Bob Iger Friday night, yeah. and by Sunday they had a deal in place, and the the announcement went out at ten o'clock Sunday night. Uh, but you're right; it can't, it can't just be this one. Now, granted, the quarter was bad. The most recent quarter was bad. Uh, I, I get that, but it, it, there has to be more going on there. And I do wonder. When you think about Bob Iger's skill, part of his skill, part of what made him a great CEO of this company for 15 years was his ability to build relationships with business partners, with talent, and his ability to sell Disney within Hollywood. Yeah. And I think we said on the show at the time when there was sort of the snafu. I think in 2020 or 2021 um, about the the Black Widow movie and Scarlett Johansson's compensation for that movie that sort of blew up and went public. I remember saying at the time, either here in the office or or uh, or maybe on one of these episodes, this is one of those things that if Bob Iger was CEO. We never would have heard about this. It would, it would have been handled behind closed doors. Yeah. They would have figured it out. And Chapek, you, you said this recently on the show, like Chapek made his bones in the parks, which is such a key part of the business. It's probably a big part of why Bob Iger himself 
tapped him. Yeah, and I think I read where Chapik did have some experience in the media segment, but that's back when like VHS ruled the day. So I <laughs> feel like you know the landscape has changed significantly since then. And and I mean to your point, yes, Bob Chapik has definitely had a few stumbles along the way as a new CEO. So maybe the sentiment started to form after a little while that that he wasn't the ideal cultural fit. I I really do believe there's something cultural here that that is that is part of of what's going on uh, with this decision. And it's not to say that's that's good or bad. I just think that's that's probably part of it. Um, but you know, the modern day media landscape is not his specialty, like we said. And given his background with a company, I mean, the modern day media landscape is is really that's the part of the business that's in the biggest state of flux right now. So I mean, you look at Disney; it's in the middle of a generational. Transition in how it produces and distributes media, and and these next few years are just utterly crucial. I, I I do get that. I think we all agree with that. So, Bob Iger has been there for all the big deals, all the strategy planning over the past decade plus. Um, I, I absolutely understand if the board has a a level of comfort with him navigating this this terrain as opposed to to Bob Chapek but I mean I will say I don't think these challenges are so easily solved right I mean he definitely has his work cut out for him because everything that's happened here just over the last 24 hours less um, I mean these this this all creates a whole new set of questions that just aren't easily answered right I mean I assume achieving streaming profitability is still the goal the key right you know we need we need to know that for sure they need to explicitly state it is 2024 still the goal as well because chapek you know had laid that out there and and whether he got there or not would have been you know we that would have remained to, to to have been seen but he at least had a path to how to get there right he he listed that out on the last call where he's talking about three key things to help them get there Focusing on increasing prices of the offering, along with the ad, the ad-supported model, they said, you know, the second is a realignment of their costs, including a meaningful rationalization of their marketing spend, and then third, ultimately leveraging all of their learnings and experience in in, in developing a, a a content slate that was just steady and high impact that never left you wanting, right? And that was something that we noted early on in Disney Plus's rollout was the content was somewhat limited; it was hit or miss. And it wasn't really as steady a state as I think they would like it to be. But, but you know, those those go to the things that that Chapek was was looking to in order to build this this streaming offering. You know, will, will Iger guarantee this performance regardless of economic conditions? Right? I think that's one thing that got <laughs> that got the market a little bit. He's like in, in that earnings call when Chapek said, "Yeah, we'll get to profitability in 2024, assuming there are no you know adverse economic conditions." Right? There's that condition, and I, I just think the market maybe isn't looking for conditions there. Uh, what do we make of of Chapek's recent rigorous review and, review and cost structure task force? Right? I mean, he, he was looking to go through the entire business, maximize efficiencies, cut costs that that weren't uh, you know really contributing to to return. I think we all probably would agree that's a good thing. Is that set to continue? I don't know how will, how will Iger approach pricing for this because. And that was one of the big differences. You Chapek was raising prices. Iger saw it as he kind of was he was kind of in favor of lower prices as, as a differentiator, right? And in well, I mean, higher prices is going to be an easier way to get you to profitability sooner. And, and so we'll, we'll have to see how Iger approaches the pricing scenario there. Um, it's almost certainly going to result in more managerial uh, musical chairs. So it's all to say that. Two years sounds like a long time for Iger to be stepping into this, but I think that time's going to go by very quickly, and he he's going to have to deliver the goods. <laughs> he is, and I'm glad you mentioned the musical chairs because Bob Chapek has spent part of his time as CEO installing his team yeah. into leadership positions. I am assuming that the board of directors knew when they made this decision over the weekend that part of what they were signing up for is almost certainly a huge changeover in the executive ranks over the next six to twelve months as Iger looks to put his team in place. And part of his job, as you said, two years is going to go by quickly. Part of his to do list is finding a successor. Yep. And for all the things Bob Iger has been great at as CEO, I would argue the thing he has been 
abjectly bad at yeah. is succession planning. <laughs> I think uh, he, he I delayed agree. his own retirement three times. He picked Shapek. You know, there were other people. Tom Staggs at one point was yeah. was the heir apparent, and. You know, I, I was thinking about this last week when we had our annual meeting, and part of our annual meeting uh, here at the Motley Fool was our CEO Tom Gardner interviewed Indra Nooyi, the former CEO of Pepsi, and it's about four years ago that she stepped down. And I think part of when you look at Nooyi's uh, time as CEO at Pepsi, part of uh, what goes in the plus column. Is the very last thing she, you know, she like her successor, um, the hand she had in picking uh, Ramon Laguarda, um, who's been CEO for four years, and that I mean that's a business that's done well uh, under his leadership. So I, I, I'm not rooting against Disney. I'm rooting for them, but uh, you know this. Knee-jerk reaction of oh, Chapex out, Iger's in. Great, let's pop the stock. It's like there is still so much work to be done here, and Iger knows that. I just hope shareholders know it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I mean, you're right. Again, I mean, I go back to all of those questions. I mean, it, it, it's we talked about this over the last couple of weeks here at HQ. You and, and I and Bill Mann were chatting about it just the other day, in in thinking, well, it would be odd to see them get rid of Chapex so soon. Based on, I mean, I mean, just the the kind words that they said about him when they re-upped him. Um, I mean, he clearly had a plan in place. He's got goals set, and, and so then we're saying, well, if you get closer to that goal of 2024, and it's becoming increasingly clear that he can't achieve that, then he really is on the hot seat, and you start to get it. Um, but but you you take this and you say, all right, well, you 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 kick Chapek out and you bring someone in. It's Iger or whoever else. But what do they do? What I mean, what do you do? Because I mean, clearly you're not going to come in and blow up the streaming offering. I mean, that's like core to the business for the coming decades plus. So, so what do you do? And 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 maybe that is where some of the cultural stuff comes into play. I mean, I know there was a reorg that that uh, Chapek undertook right as he as he got in there that took some power I think out of out of the content executives hands um, they didn't like that that much it seems like Hollywood didn't really get it either um, so I, I, I suspect we would probably see Iger make some some adjustments there as well uh, but but yeah again it, it, it's 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 one thing to replace the individual if there's just this long track record of not getting it done. But man, I mean, these guys stood up this streaming offering with like 240 million subscribers in no time whatsoever. I mean, you got to tip your cap to them, a cap to them. And clearly, the board not all that long ago was was 100% on board. It's just, it's it's a really, it's a phenomenal change of, of sentiment in such a short period of time. Jason Moser, thanks for being here. Thank you. Pinterest is a great place for finding ideas on everything from recipes to home decor, but it has been a rough year for the stock. Ricky Mulvey hosts a bull versus bear debate over the social media platform. Welcome to Bull vs. Bear. We get a stock, find some analysts, and then flip a coin to see which side they'll take. Today, the stock is Pinterest, the social media and image sharing site. We have two contestants making their Bull vs. Bear debut. On the Bull side, we have Kirsten Guerra. Thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks, Ricky. Happy to be here. And on the Bear side, it is Dylan Lewis. Dylan, good to see you. Happy to be here. Both of you own the stock, so I'm excited to hear the cases. And we will start with the bull side. Kirsten, five minutes is yours. Thanks, Ricky. So, Pinterest, for anyone who's unfamiliar, is an online platform for discovery, finding inspiration, collecting, and planning. It's kind of a half social media, half search engine. And Pinterest attracts nearly 450 month. 450 million monthly active users across the globe. Now, that user base has declined sequentially over three quarters before coming in flat in the most recent quarter. But Kirsten, you're saying, this is supposed to be the bull case. Let me finish. Here's the thing. Growing the user base isn't how Pinterest plans to grow earnings for investors. 
the growth story here is all about increasing monetization of those existing users. So that monetization goal is best tracked in a metric called average revenue per user or ARPU. And before I share with you Pinterest's ARPU, I want to give you some context for some other companies. Facebook, about 200 or about $49 ARPU. Twitter, around $26 ARPU. So now Pinterest, $6.13 in the US and Canada, only 72 cents in Europe, 11 cents across the rest of the world. We can see that social media platforms have a lot of opportunity to monetize users and Pinterest is just getting started. So here's why Pinterest is uniquely poised to generate a much stronger ARPU from here. Pinterest is an advertiser's dream platform. So one, users visit Pinterest with the mindset to discover and consume. They are primed to explore new clothes that they like, find their next travel destination, or plan their wedding. And that openness of users to discovery is very attractive to advertisers as is its trove of user data. Knowing user searches, saves, and pinboard curation really helps advertisers to keep ads highly targeted. And that's very efficient ad spend for them. Two, it, Pinterest is also just, I mean, it's a really pleasant place to be with Facebook and Instagram parent Meta pivoting in a wildly different direction and Twitter melting down. Pinterest is looking more and more attractive to advertisers. So we saw a ton of advertisers pull back from Twitter in response to fears that the platform would become less moderated, more politically charged. And Pinterest just doesn't stir those same fears. It's not built around controversy. It's just a place for people to explore, to be inspired, and to curate things that they like. Three, Pinterest is making a lot of moves to make the overall ad experience better for both advertisers and its end users. So with the acquisitions of video editing app Bochi and AI-powered shopping app The Yes, it's never been easier to make modern content like videos on Pinterest and have that content find its way to the most interested users. So how has this focus already played out over the last year? Well, international users, which represent Pinterest's biggest opportunity at nearly 80% of its monthly active users, their international average revenue per user is up 24% compared to a year ago. US and Canada is up 15%. Now, a quick note on management, um, because Pinterest did recently replace founder Ben Silverman with new CEO Bill Reddy. Now, I really liked Ben Silverman, but I think it says a lot when a company recognizes that a new lead is needed to take a company to the next level. And that's where Pinterest is now. CEO Reddy did not step up from within the ranks of Pinterest, which could be concerning, uh, but his background is strong for the task at hand. He was president of commerce, payments, and next billion users at Google. Finally, I could also mention that the company is profitable, free cash flow positive, has a very respectable debt to equity position, but I don't want to dilute the Pinterest argument too much. Again, the big story here is Pinterest's massive opportunity to monetize its existing users in a way that's beneficial to both advertisers and consumers. Kirsten Guerra, thank you for the bull case. But surely there's a reason the stock has been more than cut in half. Let's hear the bear case. Dylan Lewis, five minutes is yours. There are reasons that this company has been cut in half. And it's tough to see. I'm a Pinterest shareholder. Uh, I love the academic exercise of this because it's putting me in a spot to really question a holding. And I think it's something that everyone should do um, with any company in their portfolio. I agree with a lot of what Kirsten said. And I will say my confidence in Pinterest has been shaken recently. Let's get a little bit into why. The promise of Pinterest when it came public was, we are just beginning to effectively monetize a social media property that has a critical base of users, and we have decent levers for growth. We're going to go through a ramp up in monetizing, where we are increasing our ad inventory and expanding it over time. We're going to be exploring new ad products. We're also going to be adding more users to the site and growing the monetizable activity that happens on it. Now. I honestly think Pinterest could not have timed its public debut any better for people who were early insiders and early investors. The company came public at a time when it was putting a serious, concerted effort into monetization and was pretty much guaranteed to show gaudy top-line growth. Increasing ad load, still showing user base, there's a lot of things moving in the right direction. There's a growth story and a monetizing story happening there. 
It was founded in 2009 and did not make significant progress on monetizing for a long time. And just to kind of go back in the history of it, it crossed 500 million in trailing 12 month revenue in 2018, at a point where it had roughly 200 million users and had been around for almost a decade. When it came public in 2019, it had a $1 billion annual run rate. They then doubled their top line again at the end of 2021. Where they were a major beneficiary of the pandemic because there was a lot of focus on DIY, cooking, and home improvement inspiration. We have seen over the last couple of years the year over year growth rate grow from the 50, 60, 70% year over year range, and in the last couple of quarters, decelerate dramatically to single digit growth. My concern with Pinterest is that over the last few years, we saw the easy money get made with monetization. Because the site was barely monetized over the last couple of years, there was a lot of low hanging fruit for this business. And as a cautionary tale, I went through that period that we saw with Pinterest. That growth story is very similar to what we saw with Twitter just a few years earlier. Explosive growth until the top line hit about $2.5 billion. And then for several years, the company had a very hard time finding meaningful growth because the platform was not growing users in a big way in the most valuable ad market, which is North America. In Pinterest's case, I worry that if they're not showing growth on the user side, they're going to have to focus on monetizing the platform effectively. And I think that that's going to get a lot harder for them because as the economic outlook gets cloudier and budgets tighten up for advertisers, ad budgets are going to be focused on where marketers get the highest ROI. And that is not Pinterest. HubSpot put together a state of marketing trends report, and they do this every year. They surveyed marketers to get a feel for trends in spend and performance. They asked the question what channel has the best ROI on paid social media campaigns? Leaders Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Tumblr, Reddit, all in front of Pinterest. That is a lot of numbers to go through, and it's a lot of names to go through for marketers. Just as a case in point for the profile that Pinterest has in the digital ad market, in a 50-page report, Pinterest gets named four times. Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, etc. get name-checked dozens of times, and I worry that they are going to face that same kind of bottom of the pile status when we're looking at tighter ad budgets going forward over the next couple quarters. Dylan Lewis, he's bringing Tumblr back to the mainstream. Thank you so much for the bear case, Kirsten. Thank you for the bull case. You can go to at Motley Fool Money on Twitter and decide who made the better argument because today's lucky winner will receive. Today's lucky winner will receive salt, pepper, and storytelling. That's right. Today's winner will receive an easy weeknight asparagus recipe from Chefwell. Sure, this recipe has the cooking time and necessary ingredients, but you'll also receive a lengthy discussion on the philosophy and family history behind this delicious side. You'll get the origin story for Chefwell's roasted asparagus in the first five paragraphs. And this recipe includes some substantiated and anecdotal evidence about its health benefits. A link to this webpage could be yours if you win Bull versus Bear. Producing spices are not included. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.